A lot of you know that I used to be in the management business, and in management, one of the things you have to learn is to depend on other people to help you do your job. Uh, I would get all kinds of projects that had to be done, and I'd start trying to work on all of them, and pretty soon I'd realize that this is a lot more than I could do by myself, and I've got all these talented people to help me out. Well, that happened in the beginning of uh, the Christian world when suddenly the disciples realized that there was a lot more work to do than just a few people could handle. So they solved the problem, as here in Acts chapter uh, 6, verses uh, 1 through 9, and some, also some uh, verses from chapter 7. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. To this he replied, You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. In this gospel reading, we step back a little bit in time. Uh, we're talking about things that happened just after the Last Supper. Jesus has already washed the disciples' feet. He's explained to them that someone will betray him and someone else will totally disavow any knowledge of him. This is tough for the disciples to hear. So he gives them a little bit of comfort with these words from John 14, 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Glory and honor to God. Glory and honor. The stars by the name of the of all light, full of wisdom, full of love, glory and honor to God, glory and honor forever, glory and honor to God. Well, Mother's Day is here. Have you gotten a card for your mother or maybe received a Mother's Day card yourself? You know what the Mother's Day cards say, say something about how we as Americans view our mothers and how we relate to them. Of course, some cards just say Happy Mother's Day, like Happy Birthday or something like that. Others speak more to the mother. Um, I love you or thank you for being my mother or for being you. Or it may say, Mother, 
you are wonderful, you are my rock, you are special, you um, uh, are beautiful, you're my sunshine, you're my friend. Um, how we relate to our mothers, of course, is very important, and it's something we have for our entire lives. The Bible also talks about high esteem for mothers. Well, you know, for instance, of course, uh, the commandment. The Ten Commandments are really the basics of how to live a godly life. Um, and the first three, most importantly, of course, are how we relate to God. Um, have no other gods before me. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't make graven images. Um, remember the Sabbath day. But then the rest of the commandments how, have to do with how we relate to other people. Now, it's interesting that the very first of those commandments about how to relate to people are honor your father and mother, that it would be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. It's that kind of important thing that we have a relationship with our father and mother. And they're mentioned together, equally honored, father and mother together. Now, honor is, of course, important for our mother or father, but honor is a core belief or a core principle throughout the whole Bible. How we relate to people is, in part, honoring them. Honor is respect, esteem. It's regard for people. The opposite is are the disses. The opposites are disregard, dismiss, disparage, disrespect. Now you can wish someone a happy day with actually not even honoring them at all, but we hope those two go together, honoring them and wishing them well. Now honor is less important in our society than I think it used to be, but still very important in sectors like the military, in which honor is a core principle of how you be a soldier. Honor is mostly in the heart, and then only secondarily, or rather it's shown by our actions. Now, you've heard, of course, the five love languages, how to love people. Well, many of those same things are how to show honor to people, how to show honor by touch, how to show honor by our words, how to show honor by our uh, acts of service, by gifts, or spending quality time with people. Now, how you honor people, including your father and mother, varies a little bit. When we're younger, honor usually includes obeying. When we're older, well, it changes a little, and if the person is perhaps weak or ailing, well, then honoring is especially caring for them, looking after them in some way. And even bad people we can honor to a degree, perhaps from a distance. Honoring is a core part of the godly life. It's an important theme throughout Scripture. Honoring is something we do every day to many people, to different people in different ways, and honoring is a part of most of our relationships. Honoring is talked about often in the Bible. In Romans, Paul says, give to everyone their due. Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Oh, no, and anything except to love one another. Uh, honoring is a part of loving and a part of being like Christ. Now, you might say that people wear different hats. We use that expression. Well, sometimes it's literal. You see a person's role, for instance, in the military or in the police or firemen, by the heart hat they wear. Um, in history, many more people wore different kinds of hats to represent their role. For instance, they'd wear a hat if they were a professor, or a, a different hat if they had a particular academic degree. And so, we also honor people according to their role or their calling. Of course, honor your father and mother. That's their role or their calling, and so we honor them in that way. Paul also said, honor the king, in a way, in, in a day in which kings really didn't deserve much honor. Nowadays, we should honor our elected officials, I think, even more, because they are under the rule of law, as we are. And in a democratic society, there's a special reason for honoring them. The Bible talks about honoring our Christian leaders. Paul said, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who work in the Word and doctrine. He singled out Epaphroditus as an example of a 
Christian who went out of his way to serve Christ even at his own expense. And so we honor them for their work on behalf of us as believers. We honor husbands and wives to each other. But then the Bible extends it beyond this and says we need to honor many people, not just for their roles, especially people who do good. The apostle said, give glory, honor, and peace to everyone who does what's good, no matter what race or background. And he, special, he says, especially have honor for your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is important. Love one another with brotherly affection. Take the lead in honoring one another, the Bible says. Okay, do you honor others regularly? Is that a matter of uh, regular for you or part of your heart, part of how you treat people? Um, do you feel honored by others? Well, that's a tricky question because sometimes we are honored by others but don't really recognize it. Should we seek honor for ourselves? Well, I was thinking about this and the Emperor Nero came to mind. You remember Nero was the one who martyred Peter and Paul, the apostles. Well, Nero, even though he was emperor, sought a lot of honor. And so he pushed that the Olympic Games would be moved up a year so he could attend them, 67 AD. And he demanded that the Olympic Games include the arts, like poetry, in addition to sports. And he, he entered a lot of events himself. Well, do you want to get, guess which of the events Nero entered he won? Well, you guessed it. Of course, he's the emperor. He won every event he entered. He better, I guess. In fact, he even won a chariot race in which he fell off the chariot and didn't even finish the race. So they knew they had to give him honor even though he didn't deserve it. Well, we don't respect people like that who want honor but who do not deserve it. Jesus criticized the Pharisees for wanting honor, for instance, wanting the highest seats in the synagogue and a banquet, um, criticized them for that desire. Well, a better example is Coach Saban. You may have heard of him. He's the coach of the Alabama football university, and he's very successful. He's won a lot of championships. He said, do not seek the championship. Well, that seems odd coming from a coach, doesn't it? Don't seek the championship, he says. Instead, seek to become the best at your position. Do your job exactly right every time. And if you do your job perfectly every time, you will succeed, and then the championship will find you. Don't seek the championship. Seek the skills and the attitudes that a champion has. Well, that's a good example for us as believers, too. Don't seek honor, but seek to live an honorable life, and then honor will find you. Paul says, know how to control your body in holiness and honor. In other words, use your body in honorable ways, and honor will find you. Paul said, pray for us, for we're sure that we have a clear conscience and have desired to act honorable in all things. Don't seek to have honor, but seek to live honorably, and then honor will come to you, perhaps unexpected in unusual ways. When we honor people, we're living as Christ Jesus lives and emulating him. Okay, well, there's fruit on the tree here, but, of course, you can't have fruit unless the fruit comes out of the trunk and the roots. That's really the power behind the fruit. And so, when we do honorable things, when we receive honor, it comes from a source. And, of course, the source is God himself. God's created us in his image. Being created in his image means that we have a moral sense, that we have a spiritual sense, that we think that doing good and seeking peace is good. Now, sometimes that image is warped by sin. Well, it is warped by sin to one degree or another. But he put that, implanted that in us so that we would seek honor and live honorably. 
And so even when we live honorably, we credit God as the source, the creator, who makes that possible. And so since he's the source of honor and of honorable living, we should honor God most of all. Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, we have eternal life. It's actually his self-sacrifice on the cross, giving his life for us, taking our sins about himself. That is an honorable act. And so he received glory and honor for that act of sacrifice for us that extends us grace. When the word of God spread through Ephesus, it says the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was honored. And indeed, we honor Jesus Christ just as we honor the Father. Christ himself said this, the Father has given judgment to the Son so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. It's important to honor God from the heart, not just with our, with our lips. The Isaiah, the prophet, uh, saw the Jews of his day as having that problem in which they uh, just went through lip service, didn't really honor or believe in God with their heart. God told Isaiah, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So let's honor God to the King, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion forever. Okay, so we've talked about honoring each other, and that's important. And it's important most of all to honor a God. Okay, well, here's the surprise ending. Well, you know, every movie needs a surprise ending. You didn't expect to see this coming, but it does. You're surprised and you're amazed. Well, here's the amazing ending, I think, to a story about honor in the New Testament. God is honored, but he's not a narcissist wanting honor to himself all the time. He also gives us honor. And that's an amazing thing, that the God of the universe, immortal, invisible, the only God, whom we honor would also give us honor. Jesus said, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. It means if you serve Christ Jesus, the Lord God in heaven will honor you. And he's sure of that. That's a promise. And it's an amazing thing that God will honor us who serve Christ Jesus. The apostle said, the tested genuineness of your faith will result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ returns. That's a wonderful promise. And it means honor is always intended to be a two-way street. We honor other people, we live honorably, and they honor us. God has treated us honorably, especially by relieving us of our sins through Christ Jesus, and we honor him in return. But that amazing thing is, he honors us right back. And that's a blessing that we all receive through that grace of Christ Jesus. To the King of kings, to the Lord of lords, be honor and eternal dominion. There's a song we sing on Communion Sundays that talks about honoring our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God. You know the song. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are his. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing and honor and glory and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. 
I mean the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. You can join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.